Sometimes the light is flat, boring and useless and there's simply just not a photo to be had. And other times, well, it's next to nearly perfect conditions. At the Svinafjells glacier I've experienced both and in between. I think it's worth it. Incredible light. I'm literally on top of the world. In this video, I'm going to photograph the abstracts of the Svinafjallsjökull in Iceland and I'm also going to team up with Nigel Danson and fly my drone here. But first things first, I'm sorry for butchering all names in this episode which contains the word Jökull, but for a Dane it's a fairly hard word to pronounce in Icelandic. The Svinafjalls glacier or Svinafjalls circle is one of the first glaciers you will see driving towards eastern Iceland along the southern coast. It's located in the Skaftafjalls National Park next to its neighboring glacier Skaftafjalls circle and Svartifoss waterfall which you'll probably remember from episode 10. The Svinafjalls glacier is a glacier tongue originating from the largest glacier in Iceland, Vatnajökull, and has been used as a film set for scenes in Batman Begins, Interstellar and Game of Thrones. After you pass the road to Skaftafjall, just follow the sign down the road on your left hand towards Svinafjallsjökull. The road is very bumpy and uneven, so drive with care, especially if you are in a rented car. From the parking lot, you just follow the path towards the glacier. So I've come here to the Svinafjalls circle to photograph the abstracts of the glacier here behind me. And as you can see, there are lots of patterns and lines and shapes. And this is not really my expertise part of nature or landscape photography, but I've always found the intimate details, which in this case is not really intimate, but finding these abstracts super fascinating. At this particular glacier, if you want to photograph the abstracts, it's preferable to do it in the morning when the sun has risen beyond the mountains here, because the ice is back illuminated by the sun. This effect gives a beautiful glow to the top of the glacier, which really outlines where all the rifts are. So now it's just about zooming in and find all these repeating patterns, lines and shapes and everything which is of visual stimuli to the eye. The glacier is just absolutely massive as you can see on this footage comparing it to the small humans in the background. You can explore the area further if you want from this parking lot which is recommended even though there is another road to the glacier. Exploring the area further requires a small hike no matter where you park, so you might as well just park at the official parking lot. In my opinion, the area down at the lagoon is worth exploring, but it is also a hard location to photograph. While Nigel and I explored Iceland, this was one of the locations we visited. The area around the official parking lot is a no drone area, but you can just walk away from the tourists and fly the drone as I did here. This place is just absolutely like, <laughs> wow. Um, and I've been here a couple of times before and it's just equally impressive each time. So I started out flying around a bit with my drone. Nigel has his drone up right now. Right now I'm doing a time lapse to get some B-roll and Then I will go down here along the, the shoreline of the lagoon. It's a bit frozen, so I'm not sure if I will get anything which is, which is worth photographing, but I'll see to it. I have some quite good drone footage by now. So I come down here to the edge of the glacier. It has started snowing and you can see the glacier in the background. It's getting like washed out, very flat light. It's not really optimal right now. There's plenty of like beautiful foregrounds, but it's 
yeah, you also create depth, but the final pictures always end up being a bit like meh. So in this case, I I don't think there's a picture here today. At least not in like my style of picture. So well, I will look a bit more around and see if I if I find something. How well, Nigel, how is it going here? So difficult is how it's going here. The lights, um, I actually thought the flat light might be quite good and I think in the mountain area and the sort of glacier where you can see the blue, I think it's quite nice, but this mid-ground, which is quite a sort of a muddy colour, just doesn't work really. And But we, we found these sort of beautiful foregrounds and it's quite interesting because it's cracking as, it, as it's melting and it's so, so beautiful to listen to but and look at, but getting a shot is not that easy <laughs> really isn't yeah so i really like this this foreground just here and this triangular shape in in in, in the near foreground but then as i was just saying when you go into the midground you don't have those repeated shapes you have irregular shapes so i think one problem is the color but you can get away from the color because you can go you could make it a black and white image so that doesn't really matter too much but not having those regular continuous shapes that continue throughout the scene and take your eye up to the distant makes it very very difficult to photograph and I think we're not going to find a composition that's going to work which is a shame but sometimes it's better just to look at it and enjoy it. Also be aware that this entire area can be very very muddy in wet periods and it goes without saying but I do it anyway. Do not walk out onto the glacier it is extremely dangerous as the ice can easily break and you can find yourself trapped either in the freezing cold water or in a glacier cave with no exit, spending your final hours with the pain of broken legs and the terrorizing realization there is no hope of being rescued, although you can see the sky through the hole you fell into. I hope I made myself clear. During winter the landscape can be covered in snow, making it hard to distinguish the different layers of the scene from each other. However, the sun does set in an optimal position as to light the glacier with the last red colors of the sunset, making the glacier glow in the most beautiful pinkish tones. During summer the sun rises behind the glacier, which could potentially give some beautiful clouds or backlit effects. Admittedly, this location is very hard to photograph and get compelling photos from. Photographing with a wide angle to get that dramatic foreground makes the rest of the glacier very small in the photo. Placing a person in the photo often helps, but with a wide angle there are still kilometers between the top of the glacier, the person and you not really giving a proper scale and it's hard to find a place for your model. When I visited Fjallsalong in an earlier episode I came up with a solution I didn't show in that video, but the principle is the same. Move back, way back and zoom in. All right, so here's another great example of scale in landscape photography. So we have this massive glacier over here, Fjallsalon. And I have put Nigel just about here. And because of the distance between us, and I'm using a 200 millimeter lens, I give the illusion of compressing the scene. So this massive glacier becomes huge compared to Nigel. And even so now, I could move like even way further back if it wasn't because of the hill. And I could make Nigel even smaller. But with this 200 millimeter lens, you're moving back, you give the illusion of compressing the scene. Actually, you're not really compressing the scene. It's simply just the perspective that changes. Because the glacier is so big and Nigel is so small, so the distance between the camera and Nigel relative to the glacier becomes bigger, which means Nigel is moving closer to the glacier relative to me or the camera. And that gives the illusion of compressing the scene. Even though I'm not compressing anything, I'm only zooming in, only zooming in. So you can see here the difference between the 200mm shot and the 70mm shot is that I've zoomed in. 
I haven't changed the perspective or anything. I have more of the scene at 70 millimeter. So I'm not compressing by zooming in. I'm only zooming in. I'm cropping the picture. So you see now, I'm only cropping. There is no kind of compression at all. Only zooming. So this is one way to show the monumental scale of the glaciers. Another is obviously with the drone. As I've already covered drone photography above a glacier in my episode from Fjallsalong, you can just lean back and enjoy the epic footage. So how does the Svinafjells glacier work with the northern lights? Well, pretty good, I'd say, as the northern lights gives an extra dimension to the photograph. I was lucky enough to get some, in my experience, rather weird northern lights above the glacier. They weren't very bright, but they were remarkably active. The moon was around 60% of its full size, lighting up the foreground nicely, which were a big benefit. I tried out with a few different foregrounds along the edge of the lagoon and ended up playing around with some silhouette photos too.
Svinefjell Circle is a wildly fascinating location, as is all glaciers. It can be hard to photograph and get some compelling photos from, but as the camera technology improves, we are getting a bigger arsenal and more options to photograph during extreme conditions and from angles we could only dream of a few years back. If you enjoyed this video, I'll highly appreciate both a like and a comment, and be sure to check out all my other videos if you haven't already.